The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There may be spoilers. This episode is scripted by John Ruths, Liam McKayla and Newell Fisher. It includes adapted text from John. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 96 in which we will be looking at the second story from part one of Tales from Watership Down, chapter two. The story of the three cows. Well, that certainly was a packed episode last week and made during difficult circumstances. It is possible that I included too much and that some of the burrow keeping could have been held over to this week, but I didn't. As a result, this week's episode will be shorter than it might have been. So, on with this week's tale. Part 1. Chapter 2. The Story of the Three Cows. The pre-chapter quote is from a Dickens novel about a frustrated widower. The passage, Cows are my passion, is a part of a larger one that goes, quote, Cows are my passion. What I have ever sighed for has been a retreat to a Swiss farm and live entirely surrounded by cows and china. End quote. This chapter opens in a feel-good way. Bigwig, Fiver, Vilthuril, a.k.a. Mrs. Fiver, and Heisenthal are together in the honeycomb. Any mention of the honeycomb in this book instantly returns fans of Warship Down to our beloved Down, and this also means that it's likely once again the honeycomb it was before the FF and Raid, with the hole in the roof having started to grow over. Bigwig thinks that Elahrer are ages, and Fiver disagrees. Other rabbits are nearby, and this happens to include our favourite bard, Dandelion. The varied opinions on El Herrera and Father Time lead to the story that is also the chapter t- title, told by Dandelion. In the story, El Herrera lived on downs near Wardship Down, occasionally raiding the grounds of the big house at the base of the down. Is this a reference to Nuthanger Farm? He realises that he is beginning to change. He has reduced hearing and stiffness in a paw. This is due to ageing. One morning, El Herrera sees a yellow hammer and he realises that it is trying to communicate to him. It sings repeatedly, quote, El Herrera would not grow old if his mind were strong and his heart were bold, end quote. This reminds us of the Swift, who sang a warning to El Herrera in the story of his blessing in the original novel. Soon after he realises he's, he's ageing, this singing bird shows up. Obviously, El Herrera is curious and is out to seek the meaning of the yellow hammer's words. He seems to then more or less randomly seek the advice of any animal he runs across as to the meaning of the words. This is a different kind of Elohrara, but he is different in this book overall, more akin to the Rousery Wolf Elohrara compared to the semi-deity Elohrara we mostly got in Watership Down. He engages an old solitary hare. Hares tend to be solitary, but the fact that the hare is old tells you that it led a successful and long life. Adam seems to be telling us that to Elohrara this implies a sense of wisdom. It is the hare that clues our rabbit hero into the three cows and the secret that they apparently guard. But only after his telling our Elohrara to try the moon is meant with scepticism and refusal to give up asking. He then asks around about these three cows as even the hare had only heard of them rather than having real first-hand knowledge. In some cases he is sent on what we might call a wild goose chase. Eventually he again encounters the yellow hammer, who this time sings, quote, El Herrera behind and before, the bluebell wood and the wire, wire downs o'er, El Herrera needs search no more, end quote. And, quote, now by my wings, my tail and beak, the first cow isn't far to seek, just under the down in the neighbourhood lies the brindle cow's enchanted wood, end quote. Soon after, even though El Herrera knows of no nearby wood, he nevertheless discovers one and finds a large brown and white cow nearby. He engages this cow most respectfully. Apparently, El Herrera must go through the likely enchanted wood in spite of the first cow, telling him that there is no, no way through. This seems to be because the wood is particularly thick with thorns and briars. The cow is sitting in front of the only gap where El Herrera could get through. This cow will not move and seems not to need to feed or drink. El Herrera waits all night and into the next day. The cow tells him the wood is sacred to Lord Frith and blessed by sun and moonlight. El Herrera maybe unwisely tries to trick the cow, going off to explore a possible corner of the wood and coming back to tell her that there are a couple of badgers trying to dig their way in. 
When the cow goes off that way, Elacrera dashes into the wood very near where the cow just left. He soon finds himself lost in this strange wood, with no paths or any creatures living in it, and full of strange sounds, and at some point knows that he's been covering the same ground more than once. After rare days, or more than four, he eventually finds a stream. He is starving, as there is no grass in this wood. Surely a feature like this stream has to go somewhere, right? After following it for two days, he is beginning to get very tired and faint. After falling asleep, he wakes up to a faint glow further down the stream. Going after this, Elecrera then gets into some wet, marshy ground, and that then transitions into a meadow. This meadow has the best tasting grass he's ever eaten, and it is also full of cowslips. He soon finds a hole in a bank and sleeps for a day and a night. Waking up later, he wanders through this beautiful meadow. Dandelion's voice telling the story seems to merge with Adam's as the flowers of this meadow are described in greater detail than is common in a tale of Elacrera. Eventually, he again encounters the Yellowhammer, who this time sings, quote, Elacrera, Elacrera, Elacrera is healed and full, and he must seek the great white bull, end quote. His misunderstanding of this is much the same as the other cryptic songs. However, he also seems to trust the words of the Yellowhammer, so he continues in his quest, meeting no other animals and eating even sleeping out in the open for two nights. He travels on and eventually encounters a great white bull who is quite majestic looking. They get on straight away. This bull is lonely and is himself seeking the second cow. However, he can't get to her because she is surrounded by some unforgiving rock formations. The bull warns Elacrera, who says that maybe a creature as small as a rabbit might get through where a bull cannot. The bull leads him to the ravine where the rocks begin, and they look nearly as daunting as the thick wood. In Elacrera goes, dodging this way and that, although it is certainly not easy for him. On the third day of this part of the journey, he encounters the second cow in a flat area of ground. Not surprisingly, this cow is underfed and gaunt looking, for there is only poor grass here. Spending some days with this cow, Elohara eventually susses out that the rocks grow in her footsteps and that this is an indicator of her stony heart. He tries to encourage the cow by telling her of greener pastures and the beauty of other places where cows might graze. Not seeming to even heed our rabbit hero at first, his patience seems to be paying off as eventually she agrees to be led out of this place through the dreadful ravine. And when they arrive there, the rocks crumble and are replaced by grass. Elohara leads the second cow to the white bull, and after Elohara stays with them through the winter and following summer, in the autumn or fall, the second cow births a female calf named Whitethorn, who becomes Elohara's friend. He tells her of his adventures before he sought the three cows. He even tells her about Rousby Woof, and isn't this an interesting detail for Richard Adams to add? Well, as he's telling that tale, along comes the Yellowhammer again, who this time sings, quote, Summer's spent and almost gone. Elachrara must journey on, end quote. Elachrara does not want to leave his friends in this place, but the Elohammer sings, quote, Winter comes with snow and sleet, winter freezes to his seat. Now before the first frosts here, Elachrara must persevere, end quote. He prepares to depart to seek the third cow, but is warned about this by the white bull, who states that this creature can apparently consume the whole world. The second cow, Whitethorn's mother, suggests that Whitethorn accompany Elacrara as he realises that the yellow hammer is right. It is time for his quest to continue. The two prove to be good companions for one another, and the yellow hammer also accompanies them. After a very different winter, difficult winter of travel, during which the yellow hammer is forced to leave them, Elacrara and Whitethorn make it to the land of the third cow, who lives at, but also is, the end of the world. Does this mean geographically or chronologically? Or is it a play on words that it is only possible in some languages, English being one of them? This is reminiscent of the restaurant at the end of the universe by another Anglo Adams, Douglas Adams, at which, strangely enough, a cow, specially bred to want to be eaten, is brought to the table of the main characters. It seems that the land that Elkhara has journeyed to is actually made of, up of this creature, which follows a mythical theme of deity being embodied within landscape. Living among the gentle curves of chalk downland as I do, it is easy to see how such dreamtime themes might emerge of the divine feminine being somehow recumbent in the landscape itself. When they get to a place where they can actually address the third cow, a part of the landscape that is all cow head and sounds terrifying, it seems that she knows our hero. It turns out that the third cow is time itself.
and that naturally Ella Hrara's youth was swallowed up by her. As she says this, she yawns and swallows half a day. Ella Hrara then decides to go after his youth quite literally by going into the cavernous mouth of the third cow. In he goes, against Whitethorn's warning, and even beyond his own understanding. However, given all we know about Ella Hrara, we have never yet seen a place he won't go, but this journey seems to match the daring that he and Rabscuttle displayed on their trip to the Black Rabbit. Inside the third cow, Ella Hrara has adventures that are described as being beyond description. They involve, quote, all that has passed, end quote, all that the third cow has ever swallowed, and Ella Hrara himself becomes a dream. Eventually, stumbling through her entrails, he comes to a lake of golden milk that turns out to be in the inside of the third cow's udder. This lake shines with the light of all the suns that have ever shone. It is a lake of youth, that which Elohera has sought all this time. He falls into this lake of milk. Unable to effectively swim in the milk, he gives himself up to it and eventually gets drawn into an opening as he is suckled out by none other than Whitethorn. Having made this last and most disturbing part of the journey, the milk of the third cow renews our hero, and he again feels that his youth has returned to him. Happy and singing words that even he himself did not seem to be aware of, Elohera and Whitethorn travel on. They can now travel much faster, summer having arrived. Returning to the place the first cow was, they find that the wood, and presumably also the first cow, are no longer there. Once again, as in other transitional parts of this story, the Yellow Hammer is there to narrate. This time he sings, quote, Ella Hrara has found the truth, his secret of eternal youth. End quote. The story then quickly ends and goes back to the present in the form of Dandelion as the storyteller. Bigwig asks about Whitethorn. Dandelion does not know what became of her as the story does not address this. We don't get a sense of closure. This echoes Bigwig's astonishment at the beginning of the chapter. For after all, by regaining your youth, do you not forfeit the ultimate closure? Is it canon? John Ruth writes, quote, much like Chapter 1's The Sense of Smell, this story involves an Elohrara who is taking on a quest that you might very well compare to a knight of King Arthur's court seeking the Holy Grail. Each story is long, and while each certainly contains a clear story arc, each is also highly compartmentalised. In Warship Down, each of the, those compartments would be a separate chapter, and maybe even more than one, given the relative shortness of some of those chapters. At this point in our world, Richard Adams was a highly experienced author, having written 15 books, I think, between the Watership Down books, but he is clearly applying some different techniques here. Both of the first chapters of, of, of Tales are long ones, multi-pronged and complex stories, that, although told simply in a chronological way. I expect that some Watership Down fans may not much favour these stories. The mythical status of Elohara is seemingly reduced. In Chapter 1, Elohara identifies himself as an English rabbit, although even in Warship Down, Adam states that Uncle Remus might well have heard of him, for some of Elohara's adventures are those of Br'er of Br Rabbit. Is Elohara also Br'er Rabbit, or his American and colonial equivalent? It's hard to say, and may be left unsolved. You've also mentioned before how Chapter 1 is similar to the Ralphbury Wolf take in Warship Down. It's a good observation, and also has that effect that makes Elohara less mythical. In the case of Rousby Woof, it's because Elohara is now tangling with a dog and his human master. Compared to the other Elohara stories, it can seem beneath the others in some ways, more mundane. I think you likely feel the same or similar. This story deals with some interesting themes. I perceive these as perseverance, a common one with Elohara, friendship, purification or growth of sorts as a result of a journey, and both the passage of time and ageing. Needless to say, I read this chapter in a different per perceptive way than when I first read it in 1996, when I was a mere 30 years old. 26 years have gone by, and, like Elohara, I've suffered the effects of time. However, there is no third cow for us. We'll slowly continue to wear down and wear out as we see others do the same. It's okay, though. To age is certainly human, but there is also a definite poignancy to it, right? Certainly the case for me. End quote. Leah Michaela wrote last summer, quote, 
Tale of Three Cows stays firmly in the genre of Wonder Tales too, but seems to take a turn deeper into mysteries of a religious nature, with a description of being swallowed into the other world and reborn through the magical milk, seemingly describing a shaman's journey in worlds beyond. Somehow it made me think of Taliesin, though I must say my knowledge of the tales of Taliesin is very limited and based mostly on passing mentions. I guess someone who's grown closer to Celtic culture may have much better knowledge on Celtic tales. But, judging by Wikipedia, there might be something to do with divine bovines and shamanism in those tales as well. After reading the tale of the three cows, I started to notice there were elements of shamanism in the tale of the sense of smell as well, though dressed in a more fairy tale-like form. End quote. My overall verdict? This story is an interesting exercise in shamanic myth, but the Elachara who it features is a very different one to the trickster we met in the original novel, with only his encounter with the Black Rabbit of Inlay coming close to his manifestation here. We will return to this theme of the two Elachara's in later episodes. Overall, though, not canon, though the theme of rabbits arguing over the nature of Elachara has a certain authenticity. I cannot imagine rabbits having a doctrinaire view of their mythical hero. I wish all of you a happy new year if you celebrate at this time of year, and a healthy and happy 2023. Next time, in the third of the tales from part one, Elechera meets King Ferocious. I wonder what that name is in Lapine. Mm-hmm.